Coming up, I check out the Conics Liberator. I play some games. I have a chat to Jeff. And in a new multi-part section, I try and run a business using the Spectrum. Let's get on then. There were many interfaces for the Spectrum that did their own thing. Printer interfaces, joystick interfaces, serial interfaces, slow motion interfaces, monitor output interfaces. But there was one interface that did all of those things, the Conix Liberator. Released in early 1986 and selling for $34.95, this impressive looking device was in need of attention before I attempted to plug it in. The RF socket was loose, and the slow motion control just went round in circles, and of course it was dirty. Opening it up and the RF socket was a real mess. Not only had it come loose from the circuit board, but the connecting wire was snapped. The RF socket is used to feed the composite output, so I refixed the socket and wire. It was still a bit delicate, but we'll come to that later. The speed control though was not repairable, at least not easily. The dial was just a plastic rod with a metal bit on the end that slotted into this thing. Obviously over the years it had been turned round too hard and there's nothing to actually move now. I gave it a good clean, both the circuit board and case before fitting it back together. And it was now time to try it. Plugging it in was tricky. Not only did you have to line up the ear, mic and RF sockets, but the expansion port as well. Eventually though it slotted in and this unit also provides the power. The collar around the ear, mic and RF socket made it more sturdy when plugging it in, luckily. Powering on and there was no blue smoke. Now I can't test the printer or serial interfaces because I don't have the right leads. Apparently you need an Amstrad printer lead for it to work, and although I have something similar, I don't want to risk damaging it. It came with a driver tape if you wanted to go down that route though. So that leaves just a few things to test. The video output is working with a decent signal, as you can see. The sound output goes through the RF socket. Again, no point in testing that because I'd have to tune the TV in and mess about with all that. But there is a small adjuster here in case it's too loud. The through port then. Let's try plugging in a div MMC. Yep, that seemed to work fine. Let's load up a game. Now let's try that slow motion switch. And it actually does work, but obviously the rotary dial does nothing, so I can only slow it down by this amount. I could use a small screwdriver and try turning that thing on the motherboard, but nah, maybe something for a later project. Okay then, what about the joystick ports? Let's go for Kempston. I was a bit worried about these, because all of the holes did not have their pins. But no trouble at all. I have no idea what this switch does, as I can't find any instructions for the interface anywhere. It doesn't seem to do much. I think it may be a power switch, but it doesn't work. Well, there it is, a rather quick feature on an impressive interface. It covered most things in one great looking package. It really does look nice when it's plugged into the 48k model, and it's designed to stay connected, so any risk of damage by continually plugging it in and out was minimal. Ninja Spirit was an arcade game released by Irem in 1988. You control a ninja out to kill an evil warlock in this difficult side-scrolling beat-em-up. You can collect globes that give you better weapons and spirit ninjas to fight alongside you. A good arcade game then, but how could this be converted to the Spectrum? Released by Activision in 1990, the first impressions of this game are... Ah, oh, overcrowded monochrome background. It's so difficult to tell what's happening here. Everything just melts into one large yellow scattering of pixels. I can see what they were trying to do, but it's incredibly difficult to see projectiles and other enemies. 
The control is problematic too. You can't stand still and fight. Standing still and hitting the fire button does absolutely nothing. You have to move and fire at the same time, which feels clunky. You can swap weapons by pressing enter, and some seem better than others, but with all that stuff on screen, you always get killed by a dagger that you never see. The game plays like the arcade, with enemies coming at you from all sides. Ninjas appear from above and other weird things appear from underneath. Trying to move and fire in different directions in rapid succession is often impossible. In the arcade version some enemies are coloured red, and killing these drops a globe that can be then collected. The globes also have different colours to make them easier to spot. Now on the spectrum you get a yellow enemy who drops a yellow globe on a yellow background. Can you see the problem with that? Often you miss the globes, and to be fair you are too busy trying not to get killed. I was terrible at playing this game. My maximum game lasted about 2 minutes, probably a lot less in most cases. The graphics, if you isolate them, are pretty good, and the sound is fine with some nice music, although a bit repetitive if you keep dying. To see more of the game, I poked infinite lives, however, the problem with that is when you die you go back to the start, so not really helpful, but it does allow you to build up a huge score if you wanted to. I did once get a decent way through, but it was only once, after 30 minutes of play. Luckily I was recording it. I couldn't see more of the game because the RZX playback is denied. So really, hmm. There's not much more I can say. A very frustrating game then. This is Rally Driver, released by Hill McGibbon in 1984. Now, Hill McGibbon are usually associated with educational titles, so it would be interesting to have a look at this game. The back of the box states 3D high speed graphics, complex real life road systems, and a detailed map. Now, the detailed map is in paper form, and I don't have it sadly, but this is what it looks like. After a poor tune, you enter your name and are told about the road conditions. So, this is a rally simulation rather than a flat out racer. Oh well, let's get on and have a look. As you move down the road, slowly, you get prompts about turns and time controls. If you miss them, you either get a time penalty or your car just crashes. Even going onto the grass, flat grass, your car crashes. Not really a good simulation then. There's no engine sound with this game, in fact there's very little sound at all. And to get an idea of speed you have to keep looking down at your speed indicator. Even though you are prompted to take certain turns, you have to look at the map to make your own mind up which is the best route. And if you've been told a road is closed, you need to avoid it. The only thing you have to do is make sure you reach all of the control points. As you're driving you will pass passage points, and here on the side of the road you'll see a board, and you are told two letters. You have to remember these when you reach the control point. If you don't, you'll get another time penalty. Stopping at control points, which you have to do, involves stopping your car between the two lines. Once there, you are asked for the code. If you enter that, you'll be told if there are any diversions or closed roads ahead. And again, you need to check the map for alternative routes. Ah, I just wanted to hurtle down a truck and do power slides. Now there is a problem if you play the game with a joystick, so I discovered. You can turn the car in different ways. There's normal left and right turns, and then there are hard turns, which allow you to turn into other roads. But you can only do this on the keyboard, because the keyboard has different keys for different things. For example, a left turn, you use key 1. 
but you can't use that to turn into a junction. To turn left into a junction, you have to use the Q key, and the same goes for the right hand turns. This means that there are four keys in total for turning left and right, something you just can't do on a joystick, because the fire button is used for the handbrake. And no, you can't do handbrake turns. Playing with a the joystick then, as far as I can tell, is impossible, so there's very little point in having it in the game. This is slow, mind-numbing, and it even tells you wrong information. It says turn left, and you turn left and you crash, and get a 30 second penalty for turning into the wrong road. What the hell? Later I found I was trying to turn into a closed road, that I was told about, so the map is essential to play this game, especially when you are told diversions. To be able to get anywhere without constantly crashing, you have to drive about 30 miles per hour, which is incredibly boring. If you go faster, you'll miss turns and crash into the grass again. Mm, and that's more penalty points. Sometimes ahead you'll see a slight bend in the road, but your car just seems to head straight for the grass, so you have to drop the speed to about 10 miles per hour and just keep steering away from it. Eventually, if you're lucky, your car will magically spin and take the corner. The graphics, as you can see, are basic, with a few roadside objects, and to be honest, I'm never playing this again. I can see how it might appeal to rally enthusiasts, but give me a flat-out racer any day. Ooh, a cow! And you can't seem to avoid them. Okay. I got to a point once, near the end of the stage, about 17 minutes in, and there was a T-junction, and no matter which way I turned, I got blocked, giving me more penalty points after more penalty points. I was stuck. A lot of penalty points and swearing later, I completed the first stage, after about 20 minutes of play, and I failed to qualify. No surprises there then. I tried again, and thought I did much better, but still failed. Oh well, you can't say I didn't try. So welcome to series 13 and the return of Let's Talk About. And today we're going to talk about extras in games. Indeed, um, there are quite a few different types of extras. Some of them we've got listed, some of them may come to mind as we're talking. Do you want to start with, well, do you want to start with the things that, uh, that are in your favourite games then? Two of my favourite games both had Lords of Extras, so the Lords of Midnight and Elite. Does the lens lock in Elite count as an extra pull? Mm, tricky. It was a protection device, and we'll come on to protection later on. I don't know if it was, could be called an extra. Nah, and it was horrible, and everyone hated it. It was universally hated. <laughs> it was. So, <laughs> so yeah, let's, right, let's not talk about that anymore. Both of those came with keyboard overlays and novellas, and Elite also came with a poster. Yeah, I was going to say it came with a poster showing all the ship types, didn't it? It did. And both of them had... Well, the novella was within the manual in Lords of Midnight, but both of them had, Elite had a separate novella and manual. Both were pretty good with Elite. Elite was fantastic. The Dark Wheel, I remember reading and really enjoying it. Then another game that had a really good novella was Star Glider. Okay, yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. I was thinking more along the lines of, of the adventure games like Nighthawk. The only adventures I played were some of the early ones, The Hobbit. Well, well, well The Hobbit originally came with a book. It came with a copy of Tolkien's book, The Hobbit. Of course it did, yes. Um, I wonder, I wonder if that could be the first Spectrum game to come with an extra. I can't think of any before that. Oh, no, no, I tell a lie, there was one before it, yes, which we'll get on to next. Go on then, what was that? Keyboard overlays, these small plastic overlays that Quicksilver used to put out, and so did mm. J.K. Gray. They had a small keyboard overlay with Corridors of Genon, or Genon, however you want to pronounce it. Haven't you showed, shown them on the show before? I probably have, because I show them at every opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, some games, and I think later in the Spectrum's life, used extras to cover up the fact that the game was rubbish. <laughs> for example, wasn't, for example. wasn't there some football game that was just a rehash of a three-year-old game? There was, yeah, World Cup Carnival. It was a rehash of uh, the Arctic game. What did that come with? Uh, did that come with something? I think that came with loads. I think that came with like stickers and loads of other stuff, just to make up for the fact that the game itself was really rubbish. Yeah, a lot of games came with stickers. Pymania came with a sticker. Uh, I think The Simpsons and WWF. 
Are we only counting physical extras, or does the song on the B-side of Everyone's a Wally count? Now Wally was a builder, and he had to build an house. He knew the basics of the trade, but hadn't got the nows. To lay the bricks, dig the drains, or put in lights and doors. This is an no, extra. I, I would say that's, that's an extra. Um, Automata used to do that with um, all the Pi Mania and Pi Man stuff. They had songs. Mm. You know, I did a, um, a feature on that on the show about the songs, so I would say that's, that's an added extra, yeah. Actually, if you go if we go back to maps and posters, yeah. then the ultimate collection came with well, actually, it came with a few extras, didn't it? It came with a kind of poster that was a map of a land of ultimate, mm. and it also came with an en- a sealed envelope with tips, playing tips in it for the games. Yeah, okay, right. When I resisted for years opening that. I went back to my parents kind of sometime in the 90s and found it and goes, I may as well open this now. And the tips were rubbish. They were just things that had been (laughs) printed in the... Because they released it with Crash and it was just tips that had been in the Crash plane tips section. I thought it would be like really in-depth things of like things that only the programmers had altered you. (laughs) And they weren't. They were just a few recycled things that had been in Crash magazines. Oh dear, that's terrible. There were a lot of other games with maps. Shadow of the Unicorn had a map. Um, Rally Driver had a map which was you really needed it to play the game properly. Yeah, with Shadow of the Unicorn, of course, it also came. Was didn't it also come with a RAM expansion? It did. Yes. I don't know if that could be classed as <laughs> it, it needed it for the game. I suppose like that, was, that could be classed yeah. as, a, as a, an added extra. I don't be added extra. It's a required extra. Uh, <laughs> what about that steering wheel thing that Spirit Software put out oh. with that Formula One game that I don't think anybody's ever seen. Wasn't it described in magazines like an ashtray or as an ashtray? Yeah, a round plastic ashtray thing that didn't work very well. And wasn't the idea that to move left and right you rolled it over the keys of the keyboard? Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I think that was it. That that reminds me of that um, plastic surfboard that came with Surf Champ. That also sat on top of your keyboard and rocked backwards and forwards to control your, your surfer and that didn't work either. Were there any, ever any dance mats for the ZX Spectrum? Oh, there's a question. I haven't seen one. Mm. There's a challenge for somebody. The, the sad thing about all the extras, usually they were lost when the games got re-released as budget titles or in compilations. So, you know, you didn't get the stickers, you didn't get the maps, you, didn't, you certainly didn't get a surfboard when that was re-released. No. Um, keyboard overlays went, posters didn't come. So, so it's really sad that people that bought the games on compilations never get to see those things. Didn't some of the adventure, other adventure games come with novellas and things like that? Any of the Magnetic Scrolls or anything like that? I think they did come with games. novellas, yeah. Certainly on other formats, Magnetic Scrolls games came with maps. And mm. Guild of Thieves came with a newspaper um, that you had to Optional. look at for clues. And talk, talking of which, we come back to protection, which I knew I was going to get to. Not on the Spectrum, although they can be played on the Spectrum, but Infocom were famous for putting in things in their games and they used them as a sort of software protection. So, for example, one game, you in the game you get given an envelope by someone uh, to do a task with, and when you type examine envelope, it says, look at the envelope that came with the game for more information. <laughs> so so without the envelope, you had no idea where you're supposed to take it. It's a very good way of doing it. So you got, you got a nice thing with the game as an extra, and without it, you couldn't really play the game. But I can't think of any more extras that came with games, I'm sure... We'll get them in the comments. I'm sure there are loads of games that we haven't even talked about. Or, uh, maybe we've never even played or didn't have the originals. There is one other thing I've just thought of. Quite a few of the later Ultimate games came with a head cleaning tape. Did they? Ah. Yeah, they well. came with the Ultimate Head Cleaner. Right, well, there you go. That's an added extra. Keep your heads clean. Yeah. So there were many things. There were many really, really good games, really top games that came with added extras that really added to the game from keyboard over the overlays to novellas. And then there were undoubtedly one or two rubbish games that threw in extras to stop feeling people feeling quite so ripped off. <laughs> so that's it for the first Let's Talk About This series. Until next time, happy gaming. This is ZX Frogger, released by Arda Erdikman in 2022. Here we have the familiar Frogger game. You all know the game. You have to get your frog to safety across a road and a river. The screen aspect has been changed to match the arcade, and although movement is in characters, it plays quite well. All the features are present. 
including the diving turtles, which are often missed from Spectrum versions, and of course the annoying crocodiles. It's a good game, especially if you like Frogger. This is Beethoven's Revenge, released by ZX Amazing 2022. This polished game was created using AGX Maxi, a version of AGD that allows 24 by 24 pixel sprites, and this gives the game a different look to most AGD games. The idea is that you, Beethoven, have to rescue other great composers from prison. And to do this you have to collect musical instruments in the right order. As you can see, it's a maze game, but the 1 to 8K version has some great music. As you'd expect from AGDX, the graphics are smooth and the artist has done a really good job with the sprites. There's a lot of running around, which is what you'd expect from a maze game. Dodging dogs, plectrums and speakers and so on. And the first thing you need to do is get an ear, because Beethoven is deaf. Once you get it, you can then collect the musical instruments, but you have to do it in a certain order. I've played this game for quite a while, and I really like the music. Even on the game over screen. I never seemed to get very far, but then again, I never had patience for maze games. But this is a really great game, definitely one to try. The ZX Spectrum, when first released, was, as you may know, not aimed at gamers. It was meant to be a home computer for studies, homework and business use. As we also know though, the games market exploded and the machine became the most popular, with over 10,000 games produced for it, and a library that's still growing today. Magazines in the early years often ran stories of how people were using the machine in day-to-day -day business use, Sinclair user being a particular advocate. Over this series, I'll be trying out the Spectrum as a business machine, to see if it really could, with any great success, meet the requirements of a small enterprise selling Spectrum games. There are many elements to running a business, and I hope to address as many as possible in each episode, adding up the cost as I go along and evaluating the various options. In no particular order though, I will need to consider such things as stock control, record keeping, orders, invoices, advertising, documents, printing and much, much more. Visiting a computer specialist and not some chain box shifting dodgy outlet, my first question would be, what do I need? I have some cash, I want to run a small business and I want to use a Spectrum. I suspect the answer would start with hardware. <laughs> Now I could go straight for the plus 3 machine, it has plenty of what I need, but I want to aim for the 48k model. I may have to switch to another model at some point, but that would reflect the arrival of such machines as time progressed. The first thing I'd be looking at is a decent keyboard. I would need better storage than tape, and definitely a printer. The basics of a setup I could use day in day out as a machine to run my business. The keyboard first then, yes there were plenty to choose from. And I'm going with the brilliant low-profile keyboard for this experiment. I was originally going to use a DK Tronics keyboard, but upon setting it up, I realised that the next part of the equation just wouldn't connect properly due to the shape of the DK Tronics keyboard case. As I've said, there were many other keyboards to choose from, and I had the low-profile in the 80s, so I know it's a good, reliable choice and great to use, 
and I reviewed this in episode 105. Now onto the storage. Tape would be far too slow, so that's out of the equation. The ZX Microdrive, reviewed in episode 27, may be okay, but has limited storage, about 80k per cartridge, and it's not reliable enough for business use, I don't think, so that just leaves disk drives. An expensive add-on, but one needed if it's going to be as painless as possible. I need fast access to stock databases, spreadsheets, and management of finances, storage of documents, and even possibly some sort of newsletter, and just general business files. I'm opting here to use the Plus D interface. This is a fast, well-made unit that I reviewed in episode 111, and has the added advantage of having a printer interface built in. This means I don't have to buy yet another interface and have it hanging out of the back. I could have gone for other options, such as the Opus Discovery or Watford Espidos, but with Microdrive compliant routines, the Plus D will have a good chance of working with any Microdrive compatible software that I may use. I don't want to spend days just trying to get software onto disk, and this will also be a major factor when choosing software. Next would be a printer. The ZX printer was fabulous for a hobby machine, nice to mess about with, but for business I need something more professional, a full width printer. There are a lot to choose from, and because I own a cheaper model, I'm going for the Citizen Swift 9. I could have gone for a 120D, but I couldn't find one at the time. This 9-pin dot matrix printer works fine with the Plus D, so that makes it easier to implement, and a new ribbon is on its way. So here's the setup. I have a good keyboard, good storage, and a printer. In the next episode, we'll move on to software. <laughs>